I'm finally getting Salerno 43 on the table. And if, I've had it for a little while, but just have other games that I've wanted to play. And so finally getting this one on the table. And it's been a while since I played one of Mark Simonich's uh, series of games from GMT. I think the last one I played was Holland 44. And I'm really embarrassed to say I have not yet played Stalingrad 42. It is still sitting unpunched and awaiting some attention. But this one here... Uh, I really wanted to get this one on the table for a couple of reasons. Number one, I knew that it was uh, it, it was going to be a little bit smaller game. doesn't require a whole lot of a tabletop footprint. So let's look at that first of all. The, the map itself is uh, the same height as a standard, say, GMT map. It is a paper map. If you're attached to mounted boards, you might be disappointed with this. But the price point on this is pretty low. And I prefer to put things under plexiglass anyway. So for me, this is a win-win. What we got here is a map that's the same uh, dimensions from north to south, but east to west. It's a, a little bit shorter than a standard map. I think that if I oriented this different, I could actually put the two setup cards uh, next to each other vertically, and that would both collectively be about the size of a standard uh, map sheet. And so what you actually have is a smaller map sheet, but even within that, you can see that Maybe two-thirds of the map is actually playable, and one-third is charts and displays and uh, uh, the record track, sequence of play, things of that nature. And so you actually have a much smaller area of maneuver, and this is a much smaller game than, say, Normandy 44, Ardennes 44, Holland 44, or any of the other games. Certainly uh, Stalingrad 42, which is the, the largest in the series. So smaller game, smaller footprint, uh, one sheet of counters, and of that, uh, I think maybe about half of it is, well, maybe about two-thirds of it is, mar is is the actual units, and the rest are markers. So the objective of the game is you're going to have a like a D-Day in invasion, going to be kind of like Normandy 44, but it's handled really eloquently. You just, you, you're going to roll on a chart for each of the beaches and follow the results of that chart, and that gets you playing right away. This is a game that's pretty easy to jump right into. So I, I set it up, I played through a few, a few movements, combats, played through a couple of turns, and then I reset it up, mainly because along the way I'm making mistakes, uh, not necessarily with the rules so much as tactical mistakes. Because there's a smaller maneuver space, there is a smaller number of units themselves, it could be a little more unforgiving than, say, another game. So... What you have here is you have this open area of real estate in front of the beaches, and the Allies have got to land in this. The Germans are going to be really strong in the hills, but there's a strong temptation to go in and try to liquidate the uh, the beachhead. Can you get that done? Well, <laughs> we came close. The Germans in my game actually took out the uh, Red Beach beachhead on the American sector, before being driven back severely back into the hills in the southern part of the uh, Salerno beachhead. Up in the north, Germans almost pushed the British commandos out of Salerno. Uh, their position's been uh, basically taken over by the boys from the 82nd Airborne who landed down here within range of one of the British beachheads and then uh, went in and relieved the commandos. The commandos are Everything's kind of scattered up here because of some uh, heavy counterattacks that the Germans have done, driving the British away from this town whose name I will not try to pronounce, but it's a one-point location, a victory point location. There's another city here. It's got, actually these are towns, but the game term I think is still, um, uh, it's still treated like it's a city. So, uh, so you got one there, you got one there, and those are worth uh, one point each. The objective in the short scenario is to get eight or more victory points as the Allies. And so what the Allies have done so far is they've gotten one point, two, three, four, uh, let's see, five, six, and seven points. Those are all their victory points right now. And we are on the beginning of turn seven. So we have all this turn, all of next turn for them to get 
one more victory point. So that means they're going to have to drive the Germans out of one of these two towns. Now that's easier said than done. And the reason for that is because of the de determined defense capability that the uh, the German, well, anybody has it, but when you're defending in that kind of terrain, it's easier to uh, thwart a uh, attempt to uh, force a retreat. And so uh, you're going to need artillery, I think, probably to, uh, to manage that, but uh, that's one of the things that the Germans do have uh, access to. And so I've been slowly moving their artillery batteries back. You can always move uh, two hexes using tactical movement in this system, but if you move your artillery more than one hex, they become disrupted, and means they can't fire until the end of the turn when they uh, uh, go into a recovery phase. And so what I've been doing is uh, slowly shifting things back as the game is reaching a critical point. Now the next thing that happens whenever you fire your artillery is you got to be able to renew their uh, capabilities and you do that by spending uh, supply points and you get those every turn and how you get them has to do with the weather. And there's a really cool weather mechanic in the game where you roll a die and the weather counter is either going to stay in its column or it's going to advance one or two spaces to the right. If it reaches this space and needs to advance again, it loops around to here. So there's no guarantee that you're going to get rain. But, uh, but if you do get rain, it, uh, it means you don't get supply points. There's no air units that can support. There's no naval units that can provide gunfire support within two hexes of the, uh, of the coastline. And the Germans only get their air unit available when the weather is in this space here. And then only if the, uh, uh, the Allies uh, or the, the Germans have a... A unit or two within range of within three hexes of the airfield that which is located here. Uh, I said that kind of clumsily, so let me restate it. If the Allies control that airfield and there's no German within three spaces, three three hexes of it, uh, then the uh, even if the weather marker were to be in the Charlie box here on the weather track, the Germans would not have access to their air support marker. So you have to balance out a lot of different things in the system. Small number of units, limited number of units that you can bring into the beachheads from your floating reserve each time. Uh, you have to balance out, do I spend my artillery now? If I do spend it, do I spend the supply points to renew their capabilities uh, so I have them available for defense? Lots of challenges for both players but it plays pretty quickly because again you have a, a limited geographic area that you're fighting over and you have a limited number of units so this is really a great hex encounter game to get into uh, the games that mark has done for gmt so if you're wondering you know should i get salerno 43 i really like this one this is a this is a game that uh, you can set up and you can play it again and again and again. If you want to play the whole shebang, the game will enter in a whole new phase after, I think it is turn 11 here. I think this is when the 8th Army arrives. Yeah, turn 11 is when the map is divided into army zones. There, It's kind of hard to see maybe on the video, but there's a, a hashed line that kind of runs like an L shape across the map and what's going to happen is 8th Army is going to start showing up. Now they, they have to move slower. They're not get, they, they pay one movement point um, for, for the roads in their sector. So they do move slower than they normally would move. But they're going to start moving up and the goal is to get the Allied Army moving northward towards Rome and exiting off the north edge of the map. Kind of like in Normandy 44 when you're trying to get into Brittany uh, that's that's kind of the idea here. Or in Ardennes 44, when you're trying to exit Germans off the map um, on the other side of the Meuse River, that's the situation that you have here. Stacking rules are very similar. So if you've played any of the other games, you're going to see a lot of familiarity in the mechanics. Zock bonds, uh, stacking rules, elite units, non-elite units, uh, having tank support, all of that thing, all the things that you found in in Holland 44 and in the other games, you're going to find it in here. Now, while the rules are not identical, they're familiar enough that you should be able to jump right into this one. And the special rules in this game, I don't feel are. Um, it's not as chrome heavy. Let's put it that way. It's not as chrome heavy as say Arden 44. It's it's about this it. Same level of chrome, maybe a little bit less than uh, Normandy 44. Uh, I'll show you just a few details of the units here so you can kind of get an idea. The artwork is just fantastic. 
And so let me explain a little bit about Zoc Bonds in conclusion here. If you don't, if you're not familiar with the system, if you play the hex encounter game, you're familiar with the idea of a zone of control. The six hexes that surround a particular unit usually force an enemy to stop. So if this guy here were to move adjacent to the German, he would have to stop and end his turn for that phase. In this system, that's also true, but there's an additional component. An infantry unit like this can cross these mountain hex sides. However, this unit could never enter this hex because in between two units, there is what's known as a Zoc bond. And what it shows, what this is attempting to demonstrate is these two units are collectively spilling over into this hex. And so nothing can enter this hex until you deal with either of those pieces there. So Zoc bonds form an, ent an entire hex. They will block an entire hex. They can also block a hex side. Let me show you an example where that is in play. Uh, let's see. Actually, here's a good example right here. If the Americans, the Americans could get a, a unit into, say, this hex right here. Let's say the Germans are, uh, are uh, in a defensive situation, maybe a uh, uh, there's nobody in this hex. Let's say this hex is empty, but we wanted to get somebody in, get a third unit adjacent to this location. What would happen is because we have a German here and a German here, you cannot cross this hex side. So that's how a hex side Zoc bond is formed. So again, up here, you see there's a hex Zoc bond there. Nothing can enter into this particular hex because of that unit and that unit. If we are to shift these guys like so, a Zoc bond exists diagonally between these two. And so a unit could be here now, but could not cross into here. And so that's how Zoc bonds work. And it creates some really interesting strategies without a lot of rules weight. So I really like this particular system. And this is my take on Salerno 43. Hope you enjoyed the video. Please subscribe to the channel if you enjoy these. We'll be trying to produce more as the days go on so Salerno 43 by GMT Games show you the cover here so you can recognize it that's what we got on the table been enjoying this one again hope you enjoyed the video